He covers the Los Angeles Clippers for the LA Times. We welcome Andrew Greif onto Hoopsology. How's it going, Andrew? It's going well. Yeah, I'm out here in Boston. Um, there could be worse places to spend some time, so things are going pretty well. I appreciate you coming on to the show, and I just want to get your insight, Andrew. We were talking just off air about this everything going on with the NBA and the pandemic. Can you just kind of get the overall feel what these players are going through, as just as human beings regarding just the COVID protocols? Is there a sense of like the players falling in line? This is kind of normal life. They're just going to kind of do what they got to do to get back onto the court, or do you think there's a sense of just frustration just from a human perspective that this having to go through all this in terms of being in COVID pro- protocols, being out of it, just the games being postponed, like kind of what's the feeling of, of course the Clippers, but their opponents as well just going through this whole thing. I think, I think both those things you said are true at the same time, you know, like people who've been through the, the shutdown in 2020 know how strange that was, how kind of scary it was to be, to not have a season and to not know when you'd play again. So there's obviously like a gratefulness that the season is on track, that the games are being played pretty much for the most part. I think today was the 11th postponed game of the year. Um, at the same time, you know, it, people are frustrated that, you know, they're having to call up in some ways, like some teams such as the Atlanta Hawks, you're calling up almost the entire roster from a different team, from, from G League, from overseas, from anywhere you can. So I think there's a lot of frustration from, you know, front offices and coaching staffs and players about kind of the products on the floor. Um, you know, like there's no one, you know, it's like because these thing, this thing is asymptomatic in a lot of cases, there's a lot of obviously um, confusion. Sometimes like the team will come on a plane like the Clippers did, you know, they had Brandon Boston and uh, he tested positive or he was in the protocols, I should say, on uh, late Tuesday night. And it's like, you know, once, once a guy like that is sort of around you, you start to kind of question like, oh my gosh, you know, do I have it? It's natural to think that way. So there's, there's a lot of fear, um, there's confusion, there's frustration. Um, and and that obviously there's also some gratefulness that they're still able to play, even if it's in some cases real shell of a team. I think Utah is really the only team I can think of that has yet been truly affected by this. Wow. Um, so the, the best availability really is availability right now. I want to ask you, and forgive me if this is kind of an ignorant question, but from the players that you've covered around the league, um, I think Jason Tatum is the most notable case that he's suffered kind of long-term effects from COVID, from from what I can tell. I'm sure some other players, but is there a sense that the players that have actually been infected, for the most part, they recover and and this it hasn't affected their play on the floor. Does that kind of contribute as to really what's happening here in terms of a lot of these players? They fit into that non kind of danger category in terms of being fairly healthy, young, and mostly vaccinated. Is there just a sense of frustration in terms of they're doing everything right, but then they're being punished? You know, in some sense, just because of these new protocols. It's kind of like, hey, we 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 agree to what do you. The NBA has put down here, but yet we have to go through all these different hoops and loops just to play. Is I guess there's, there's kind of like that a frustration as well, or is there still a real fear of what this this virus can do to them in terms of their health? Yeah, I mean the the the, the vaccinations being available, let alone in the NBA, the whole world, obviously that changes the calculus a little bit because it does mm-hmm. offer that safety blanket that you know you should if you get you know COVID, um, it should kind of blunt the symptoms if if you feel the symptoms at all. Um, But, I mean, even yesterday, Marcus Morris, for example, the Clippers forward, he missed several games in protocols, and we asked him just how he was feeling. And he said that he's he's felt now two games being back that his breathing has been a little funny. Those are his words. My breathing's been funny. And, you know, you never want to hear that. Um, So I do think that I would have to think that, you know, just from general anecdotal evidence, it seems like a lot of guys come out and didn't feel like they had symptoms and it was sort of just a weird quarantine period, but they're back on the court, right? Like Reggie Jackson yesterday, he wanted to play immediately. He got out of quarantine, took a private jet from LA to Boston, and he wanted to play yesterday, but he just couldn't do it because you just can't bring a guy back after eight days in quarantine and playing that night. Um, but so that would lead me to think that, you know, he really didn't have too many symptoms. And that's what he told Ty Lu too, throughout the process. But other guys, like the Morrises of the world, Jason Tatum's, it lingers, and it's and it can be something that's scary. And, and you do think about the long tail effect and how it still feels like those long haul COVID cases um, in the NBA and regular life 
it feel like it's sort of this gray area we don't have a whole lot of research on. So that's the scary thing, I think, for sure, especially when your whole livelihood depends on your conditioning and your cardio. Absolutely. Andrew, I, I want to shift to the Clippers. Such an interesting team this year. I, I think right off the bat, I mean, with Kawhi being out, there's there's kind of like blunted expectations. Based on what you have seen so far, have the Clippers met or exceeded your expectations for this year? Or have they played behind them a little bit? I think right now, if I'm not mistaken, they're sixth in the West and 13th overall in the NBA in terms of record. Um, what were expectations going into this year and how do you feel the Clippers have kind of performed based on those expectations? Their own expectations were to still challenge for a playoff spot. You know, they, they never looked at this year as kind of like a let's bottom out and let's sort of like just run the young guys out there and totally develop them. Um, you know, but they had three draft picks from last year's draft. Um, developing those guys is a is it something that they want to do? Absolutely. Brandon Boston, Keon Johnson, and Jason Preston, who's been hurt the whole year. They want those guys to develop because they really feel like they have an open window to win a championship that's like years long with Kawhi and Paul George. And that if you can develop those young guys now, you know, maybe they're rotational pieces. Maybe they're the next Terrence Mann where, you know, in a year or two, hey, you plug that guy in, you know, the, the, the time he got 20 minutes in 2021, those could be valuable in 2023 in the spring of 2023. So while that is really important to what this team's mission was this year, um, they, they didn't, they've never taken their eye off the ball of winning. They want to win and, and get to the playoffs. Um, you know, Ty Lu is not a guy who, if you, you know, if you tell him, don't worry about winning, just worry about developing. Like he, he wants to win. He's a competitive <laughs> guy. So that was never going to sit well with him, just his nature. Um, so it, it has been sort of this hybrid year where I think that, yeah. Um, I don't know what internal expectations have been about Kawhi's availability, but Kawhi himself on media day said that he structured his deal as a three plus one because he hoped to play this year. He, he was hoping he could do it this year. So I take him at his word that at least he at some point has hoped there's a chance. So, you know, this team, I think was with that in mind, you know, they, they want to make, try to make the playoffs if they get Kawhi back. And I think that's still a big if. Maybe some magic happens. Maybe they can turn it on. The West is so um, fairly level from it feels like three through ten mm -hmm. that you know maybe you catch some magic. Um, but it, it, with Paul George out for probably another month, it does feel like it's slowly becoming more about twenty twenty two twenty three be, just because of the development aspect of it. Gotcha. It has there been in in terms of like locker room and organizational dynamics? Have you seen any sort of shift this year with kind of Paul George uh, running the show, so to speak, or, or being that lead go-to player uh, without Kawhi there? Has, has there been any sort of change in dynamics there? I think that, you know, Paul incredibly came into the season incredibly in a good headspace. He told me that. I wrote a season preview about Paul, and he, we sat down during an open practice, and he said that basically – all the kind of stuff that was around him after 2020 in the bubble, he sort of went to a place in that off season that followed and said, like, I'm past that. I'm done. Like, I have to work through it. And getting the playoff last year and playing those eight games without Kawhi, playing well, um, really, I think for him, cleared his head. Um, that game five win in the second round against Utah, you know, that, that plane ride home after that game, I think that was a huge moment where, like, you know, he had, I think, 37 and I want to say 14 um, in that game on the road, I think it was a huge moment for Paul's confidence. Not that he wasn't confident, but just like he could, you could feel sort of the weight lifting off his shoulders no matter what happened. And then to get to the Western Conference Finals. So he came into this thing with an incredibly, in a, in a, in a good place, mentally confident. Um, and I think you're seeing that. Like Paul's a pretty fun guy. Like he's, he's a guy who um, teammates like to be around. Um, and I think that I really captured that in early on in training camp, you know, like there, there was a pretty jovial mood about camp, even though, like you said, expectations are kind of funny this year. Like what, what exactly is this team? Um, it still felt like a team that didn't have any sort of like gloom hanging over it. Cause you just weren't sure what might happen. I think that Paul tried to intentionally keep it pretty light and, and let guys know that, Hey, we're just going to go out there and play and don't worry about what people say, let's just go have some fun. And I, so I think that he's, that's been noticeable for me. A lot of players said too, that Paul, was, you know, was speaking up more and taking more of like a vocal role 
than he had in the past. Um, you know, stopping a drill a couple times and saying, we got it, we got to get this thing better, you know, do it tighter, do it better. And they were saying that's not something he would do in the past. So I think he sort of found his role, found his voice. And at least from the outside looking in and talking to some people, it felt like there was a pretty light mood to it all this year. And I think a lot of that goes to Paul. So what happens if the Clippers, when Paul George returns, when we, if the Clippers were in a play a play-in game or they're in a playoff series, and you know Paul George is blamed, rightly or wrongly, for them, you know, losing a game or even losing the series? How much of a tool do you think that'll have on him? Do you think he's more equipped to deal with that criticism as opposed to the bubble, or do you think, hey, there might be there might be some roadblocks if that does appear again? I I wouldn't expect him to be as um, as affected by it, Be, just based on our, again our conversation in preseason, he said that he sort of the road to to getting better to improving is sort of reflecting on where things went wrong, right? And he said that he basically realized that he was the type of person who did care about what people said about him, and he was the person who noticed. Um, he was he's not the person who can just go tunnel vision, you know. Like he's a people pleaser by personality, and when it comes to like receiving criticism from random strangers online. That's not always a good thing. So I think that he kind of had to realize that about himself and realize that to get better, he just had to cut that part of him off. And, and I think that that's why there's a lot more of a, um, a feeling of that being at peace that I noticed with Paul, and he expressed that going in. So I wouldn't, I just wouldn't think that it would take him, um, kind of distract his focus like maybe it did in 2020. You know, he really, he really felt like last year was the beginning of a changed Paul George. Um, Andrew, I want to ask you one more question uh, before I pass it to Matt. And um, that's with the the rules changes and um, the ball as well. I know that's kind of maybe my new point, but one of the other journalists that we talked to in terms of them changing the ball, it seemed like it was kind of a factor in terms of how players were shooting as well as the rules changes. In terms of the Clippers this season, um, has their play been affected by any of these two changes in a drastic way? Or has it been, kind of been business as usual in terms of how um, they implement their game plan on the court? Do you think in terms of the more physical play, that has been an adjustment as well as the new ball? Have you seen any of those two factors play a role in the season as well? I think you know those two early on definitely talked about a lot. I think we also have to talk about the return of fans to True. arenas. I mean, last year was target practice, essentially, for some of the world's best shooters. There, were, there, were, there was no one in your ear yelling at you other than the, your opponent in front of you. So I really do think from talking to people, that was a, a big factor that went into last year's record shooting um, or throughout the league. So um, I think that I sense, and I haven't covered the league that long. It's only my fourth year. But it seems like every year there's a new rules change, and it gets talked about a lot for the first month, and people kind of moan and groan, and then you never hear about it again. And so I really haven't heard almost anything about the rules change probably since like the last week of November. The ball discussion uh really went away. Um, and I can talk to you about the ball for like f- five hours because I went to Chicago where the leather is made, where they process the leather in awesome. a tannery. I saw it on the line where they, I saw it when it's blue, like a steer hide. And that's what it looks <laughs> like. You know, I, I went to the place where they did a lot of their, the R and D, the research and development. Wilson does that stuff. I heard about the player feedback surveys. They surveyed more than 300 players in the year before the ball ever showed up on a court. So they really took a careful approach to it. And a lot of players did feel like, you know, they still didn't like it, but I just haven't heard it it really ever since. So I would say that um, all three of those things are certainly on people's minds, though. Whether that's a perception or reality, it's something people have talked about, but I, I feel like the volume truly has gone down quite a bit. Got you, Andrew. Um, I, I want to go back to this this dynamic between like Paul George and, and Kawhi Leonard. We haven't really gotten to dig into the Clippers with any of our guests so far this season, and, and something that I've been really curious about. And you mentioned, you know, Paul George being a people pleaser, being more involved with leadership this season. Is is there any sort of sense that like? Kawhi was blunting that or it was it was difficult for them to lead together and now he has more freedom I mean these are like I guess kind of obvious things to look over from the outside looking in uh, and, and probably overly simplistic but what is that dynamic like between those two and is there any any sort of worry that you know Paul George has to kind of like back off or play differently 
if a Kawhi Leonard return happens later this season? Uh, those two have a really good relationship. Um, and I think that something that people brought up was, you know, some of Paul George's favorite uh, times of his career was when he played in Oklahoma City against Russell Westbrook, with Russell Westbrook, but like, you know what I mean, like off him, like, you know, complimenting his personality and right. his role. Um, I think that it's been described to me that Paul is a good teammate. You know, he's someone who doesn't mind being the 1B, um, even though he knows he's a 1A talent. Uh, he, he likes the ability to blend in. So I wouldn't say that um, from what I can gather that, you know, one was blunting the other. I think that it's Paul's nature to sort of just be like, where do you need me? Where, how can I help? You know, like, do you need me to grab 14 rebounds in a closeout game? Because I'll do that. I don't have to score as, as many. Um, you know, do you need me? Well, Kawhi's taking over in game six against Dallas, in Dallas. How, what can I do? Grab the digit rebounds. Can I defend? What can I? So um, I think that this is maybe some of, it, it is this year, just the lightness. Uh, I think that people feel like, yeah, that, that really is like Paul. You know, like he's, he's just a guy who wants to bring that out of people and keep people at ease. Um, and I don't really, you know, I think Kawhi's leadership style, people talk about how he is more vocal than you ever would assume. Um, you know, the, the, the full picture of sort of how he, he leads is sort of still something that's a little murky. Um, but people have said that he's made a lot of strides and just f- sort of feeling more comfortable and like just, just talking more, you know, and being more vocal. Um, you, we've been in the shoot arounds this year when, you know, you'll see at the far end of the court, Kawhi's talking with a guy, sort of like directing him and pointing here and there. Um, so I, you do sense that there is a little bit of like the coach Kawhi coming out, as Ty Lu said. Um, to what to what extent that really comes out, I'm not sure. But he's at there. He's at pretty much every home game, sitting on the bench. You'd have to think he's sharing some of what he's seeing to guys. Um, so it is. I think the more the thing I'm very very fascinated by is like just strictly on court when they get back to playing. You know, how do you keep this version of Paul George, who was really in that MVP discussion throughout the season's first quarter, um, you know, through late November, how do you keep that version? And also get the Kawhi we know and how good, you know, is it possible to even get both guys operating at the peak, the peak of their powers? Uh, it's, I had a thought exercise in November about like, what's the best, what's the best duo in NBA history where each guy has produced to like the utmost of their full capacity while playing with another one. Mm. And, and I think it's an interesting discussion. Like, you know, yes. how, how close to 100% of maximum output can Kawhi and Paul George get to one another? I mean, that's, that's really talking about the title window. It's how they find those tiny fractions of those edges in the coming years uh, is going to be the difference. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And it seems like this day and age in the NBA where, you know, we talk more and more about positionless basketball. I mean, granted, we're not all the way there, but you see, you know, like Giannis being a rim defender who can – sprint down the court on and lead a fast break no problem finish the fast break um i i think there has to be a way that those two guys can can fit together and maybe that's the the multi-million dollar question for the organization is just finding out what the perfect combo is yeah and, and really I think the the thing that i've never heard anyone actually say it but i think the thing that if you ask the clippers what like really pains them about Kawhi's injury last year in the playoffs was game three and game four against the jazz really was to my opinion, like the window of what those two guys could look like operating at close or near their full powers. You know, each guy had 30 points in, in games three and four. Uh, They were dominant defensively. They just, you know, Utah couldn't do a thing. Kawhi had that incredible dunk in game four. Um, that was really when, and they'd played well together before, but maybe not to that level. And that's sort of when I was like, whoa, okay, like this is, these guys are firing on all cylinders. And then for quite to get hurt right then, I think that's, that's the thing. Cause people saw it. They truly, truly saw it for the first time. Like these guys are, are to use an overtired phrase that they're a problem, you know, when you pair them yeah. up together like mm-hmm. that. Um, and that's then he true. gets hurt. So it's, it's kind of a, if you're a basketball fan, that was sort of like, oh man, like we've been waiting, we've been waiting for two seasons and they, now we don't get that for at least a little bit longer. Absolutely. Well, I think it's fascinating too, because it's, it's kind of like a timeline situation, right? In terms of different deals in the NBA, the Houston Rockets come to mind when they were right there with their 
with their roster. You know, it didn't work out with circumstances. Then you see Boston where there's Tatum and Brown where it's like, how can this not work? And now there's been talks of like a breaking them up. You take a look at the Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid situation. But yeah, you see with the Golden State Warriors with Clay and Steph Curry, what you're mentioning, Andrew, in terms of, I feel like with those two, they're operating at maximum efficiency in terms of what they can do um, on the court. And even with Kevin Durant, I mean, we saw, we saw, I mean, all three of them really operating at such a maximum efficiency. It can be done. And even with the Miami Heat back in the day with um, Dwayne Wade and LeBron. So I, I just wonder when it's kind of like the patience is going to run out with Paul George and Kawhi in terms of working together. Is, is there... I don't think they've sat down and they planned out like a definite timeline, but is there a working relationship between the two of them in terms of just trying to make this work once Kawhi is healthy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And again, the, the Clippers really feel like they have a, a long window. You know, they have both these guys locked up at least, or I want to say 2024, 25, which is the first year that the Clippers hope to open their new arena in Inglewood. Like yes. that, getting these guys on their roster the first time was a really big deal in 2019, obviously. But getting them signed a second time was really, I think, the litmus test to, okay, are the Clippers, you know, are they, are they really that attractive place? Can they really hold on, not just, you know, sign a guy, but then retain them? Um, and, and I think, so that's why this summer was a really big deal. You know, they already had Paul locked up in a long-term extension uh, a year ago right now. But to get Kawhi to return, uh, you know, I think spoke a lot about, so the respect for Ty Lue, the respect for the front office, and really this feeling like, you know, we can, we can, we still have time to go. And so that's why you saw the team did do what they did in the draft. You know, they went and got young guys because they knew, and that's why they traded Patrick Beverly and Rajon Rondo. And they knew they couldn't continue the next three, you know, three or four or five years until these guys' contracts run out with an older aging core. And so they, they really felt like, Let's get let's supplement the Terrence Manns, the Avita Zubatses, and the Luke Kennards of the world with younger guys. You know, let's build these guys up so that we can extend the window. So I think that there is a lot of confidence, at least organizationally, in sort of the long term, uh, you know, potential for Kawhi and PG working together. And now, now, now it's about how you surround them, right? And that's a, that's a, a you know, I guess what's the salary cap? You know, one hundred and fifteen million dollar question is you know, how you do that organizationally across the NBA. And the Clippers feel like this is their recipe, and I guess we'll see. A lot of that, of course, is injuries. Andrew, I want to ask you, you mentioned the new arena, and can you kind of mention that dynamic of the Clippers moving to that new arena in Inglewood, and that's them having to split that time you know, in the Staples Center um, with the Lakers? Like, How important is this move to them having – their own arena in Inglewood going to be for this franchise. Is that going to make them have an established identity with this team compared to always kind of splitting that with the Lakers? Like how important is this move uh, for this team to Inglewood or is, is it kind of overblown? Like, what do you think he explained it to maybe the fans that don't live in that area? How important is building that arena there? Right. And, and, and they're splitting their current arena, which I guess I was about to call Staples Center. It's not anymore. It's Crypto.com. Crypto.com yeah. Arena. <laughs> that, it doesn't come naturally to say that. Um, they, they split that three ways. You know, they're the, they get the third choice. It's the Kings, LA Kings first, That's then right. the Lakers, and then the Clippers. So wow. there's a lot of, I think if you polled Clippers fans about the thing they hate most about the schedule every year, they would tell you 1230 games on the weekend. Uh, mm. The Clippers get slotted in a lot of those, the front end of a doubleheader with the Kings of the Lakers. So I, I think there's that, there's that kind of like really m micro part of it, of like just scheduling frustration. But I think on the macro, there's been, since Balmer bought the team, all, of course, everyone brings up, when are you going to move the team to Seattle? Why don't you move the team to Seattle? Why don't you move the team? You know, this is sort of literally planting their flag in the ground in Inglewood and saying, you no, know, this is our long term home. We're spending more than a billion dollars. Of Balmer's money on this, um, you know, this is where we want to be. So I think I sort of think you quiet that conversation. Um, but the dynamic is that this is a Lakers town, and they, and they no one really runs from that. Like it's not something that's a controversial take. Um, the LA is beholden to the Lakers and, and like the Dodgers and USC football to a degree. Um, and so I, I don't think that the Clippers are thinking this is going to change things overnight. But they've done some initiatives over the years. You know, giving out backpacks to kids and like, put, like putting their back, their bunch of new backboards across parks all across the city. I think if they have a master plan, 
they would hope that if they win enough now um, and they have this, you know, new arena that people are excited about, you know, maybe you change some hearts and minds in like the next generation and the generation after that. Um, you know, you think about kids. I wrote a story last uh, last month about well, I said earlier this month about the ten year anniversary of the Chris Paul trade that didn't happen mm. and how it like, there's kids. There are kids who are ten years old who basically don't know anything, you know, other than like years of the Lakers not being good until they got LeBron and the Clippers being really good. So, you know, if they can continue on this path you could see a future where people that sort of like really awful history of the Clippers, the eighties and nineties sort of recedes and people will start to go, Oh really that, that happened. So I think if, if their plan is like long-term competence and success, maybe they change heart and minds and, and kind of again say, we're not leaving and we're not backing away from the title contention. Like this is us now. So I, I, I think that's probably their biggest, biggest picture approach. Man, I just can't believe that that Chris Paul deal was 10 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Time oh flies. Oh, my gosh. Um, getting old. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I wanted to ask you, you mentioned, you know, this plan around building around Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. As we get closer and closer to the trade deadline, do you think, you know, there's a lot of salaries that are locked up on this roster, of course. Do you think um, we're going to see any activity from the Clippers on the trade deadline or kind of uh, holding pieces that they have in place right now. I think it's going to be, it's really cr- interesting across the league, just how much material movement really happens because teams have not had many opportunities to really sense who their team is this year because of absences, because of COVID or injuries. I don't sense there's a whole lot of teams that really truly know outside of probably Utah, who's going to have been healthy and they have a lot of returners. If they really know kind of what their team is, you know, are you, are you going to cut bait on a player um, if you really haven't seen how they fit with your core? Um, and so league-wide, I think that's one of the most fascinating questions is sort of how active is the market um, when you know you just don't know sort of what the roster looks like that you, that you even have. Like, how do you know what you need to improve if you haven't seen it? With the Clippers, um, I, it's, it's because, again, it sort of feels like this transitional year I don't really know how much movement uh, they would have because if they run back next year, you know, they have Marcus Morris on a long-term deal, Kennard, obviously PG and Kawhi, uh, Nicholas Batum is back next year, Reggie Jackson. Uh, you know, outside of Serge Ibaka, I, uh, I, I really don't know kind of that obvious trade candidate. I think that they probably are always looking for ways to how can we get that third star. I'm sure that you know, what team essentially is not doing that, that you have to amass stars. But um, – I really do kind of think that outside of Serge Ibaka, you know, if his utility is seen as greater for somebody else, what would they give up for him? Um, if, if you know, I think his best availability for the Clippers right now, his best strength is his playoff experience, right? Do the Clippers feel like that's necessary because of where their season is headed, their trajectory is headed? If, if guys are out for longer for COVID or, or injury, do they feel like that's really necessary, or or could they try to find something else in return? That's something I'm interested in, of course, because I think Serge is still a useful player. Um, does does someone else's um, a use for him outweigh the Clippers? I don't know. I guess we'll find out in about six weeks. Andrew, thank you very much for appearing on the show. Can you please let our audience know where they can find you on social media and also um, where they can find your published works and anything else you're working on for the new year as well? Yeah. No, I appreciate it, guys. Um, uh, you follow me on Twitter at Andrew Greif. That's G R E I F. Um, I, you know, all of the LA times.com go to the sports page. We got tons of great stuff. We're on an amazing staff. So I think you could, you know, confidently fall down a rabbit hole of like a bunch of different stuff if you go there, but obviously you know where to just, you know, Clippers tab. So that's pretty easy to find. But, uh, I, I, I try to, you know, I try to tell people stuff they don't know, you know, from a game, from a feature. I've been really happy with the work we did in 2021. Uh, kind of following these guys through the year. So I'm hopeful to keep doing that 2022, of course. So I'd appreciate anyone to follow along. I appreciate you, Andrew. Thank you very much for appearing on the show. Of course. Anytime, guys. Thank you.